What happens if you take a Hooke's Law spring and a pendulum and you put them together? You get a springulum, or more formally known as the elastic pendulum. Let's derive the equations of motion for this elastic pendulum together using Lagrangian mechanics. In this derivation, I'm going to emphasize the following three key steps. One, we determine the set of generalized coordinates to fully describe our elastic pendulum. Two, we determine our Lagrangian function in terms of these coordinates. And three, once we have defined our Lagrangian, we plug it into the Euler-Lagrange equations for each of our coordinates and extract out the equations of motion. Let's get started. All right, so I've drawn out our elastic pendulum here, which we can think of as a Hooke's Law spring of some spring constant k with a block of mass, little m, attached to the end of that spring. All right, and so I've drawn this spring pendulum here at some arbitrary position in its trajectory. So of course, at any time, it could be at some angle theta, and we could have this stretch rho from the spring's equilibrium length of L naught. Okay, and so theta and rho, these are going to be the coordinates, the generalized coordinates to describe our system, right? The angular displacement from this vertical and this radial displacement from this equilibrium position here. All right, so we've already done step one. We've determined the coordinates that we want to track, our radial stretch rho and this angle theta. All right, and this is very standard notation in Lagrangian mechanics to write out all of your coordinates and you put them in a vector q. All right, and it totally makes sense that when you couple a spring and a pendulum together, you would have these two independent coordinates here. But real quick, how would we verify that we actually just need two independent coordinates, no more or no less to describe our system? All right, so there's actually a really nice and easy formula to describe the degrees of freedom of your system, and it looks like this. The degrees of freedom d of your system are going to be equal to 3n minus c, where n is the number of particles that you're tracking and c is the number of constraints. So in this case, we're really tracking one particle, the block, so n is going to be equal to 1, and we have one constraint, which is that this problem is fixed within this 2d plane. So c here is equal to 1, and that gives us two degrees of freedom. All right, and the degrees of freedom is going to tell you the minimum number of coordinates that you need to describe your system. So while in this case, it's fairly obvious that we need to track this stretch rho and this angle theta, in more complicated problems, knowing the degrees of freedom of your system is very, very helpful because it at least gives you a hint to the number of coordinates that you need to track. All right, and so with any problem in Lagrangian mechanics, what we need to do is we need to write out our Lagrangian function in terms of these coordinates here. And specifically to define our Lagrangian, we're going to need to write out the kinetic energy function and the potential energy function in terms of our coordinates. All right, so first let's go ahead and define our kinetic energy function for this system here. So if I were to go through, right, I could draw out some position vector, right, from our origin, which I'm gonna put at the top of the ceiling here. So I'm gonna, from this origin O here, I'm going to track our block with a position vector R. All right, so kinetic energy, very generally, is going to be equal to one half times the mass of our block times, of course, V squared, which in this context, Velocity is going to be the time derivative of our position, so r dot, dot, r dot. Right, and I think the first thing we can appreciate is that it's going to be very convenient to write out these vectors using a polar coordinate system, right? We have this polar angle uh, theta here, and you know, our mass is always going to be some radial distance from this origin, right? L naught plus rho. So this combined distance is the radial distance that this block is going to be out away from this origin. All right, so let me go ahead and define our unit vectors and polar coordinates. Here's gonna be r hat, and perpendicular to that is theta hat. And so let's go ahead and recall the general formula for velocity in a polar coordinate system. That's going to look like r dot r hat 
plus r theta dot theta hat. All right, and so remember that r here, right, the length of this vector is really just going to be l naught plus rho. All right, and so we'll plug this l naught plus rho straight in. We're going to have r dot is equal to rho dot r hat plus l naught plus rho times theta dot in the theta hat direction. I just plugged straight in, and remember when I take this time derivative here, L naught is a constant, so that derivative goes to zero. All right, so now we can go ahead and plug R dot right into our kinetic energy expression, right? We're just squaring it, so we're going to have rho dot squared plus L naught plus rho squared theta dot squared. And this is the expression for our kinetic energy. All right, excellent. So we have the first half done here. We have our kinetic energy function. Next, let's go ahead and determine our system's potential energy, right? And so we have two contributions to our potential energy, right? The first contribution is going to be a gravitational potential energy, and the second is going to be potential energy stored in our spring. So first, let's go ahead and determine our gravitational potential energy. Remember, with gravitational potential energy, you can define your zero point wherever you want. So for example, I can go ahead and conveniently define the ceiling, right, as this is going to be my location of zero gravitational potential energy. All right, and with respect to this zero point here, my block is going to have a negative gravitational potential energy, right? It's below the zero point. So it's going to look like minus mg times this height here. What is that height? Well, let me go ahead and redraw this triangle super duper clearly, right? We have this angle theta here. We have this hypotenuse, which is L naught plus rho. L naught plus rho, and now we should be able to very clearly see that this height here is L naught plus rho cos theta. All right, great. So we have the first part here of our potential energy. We have minus mg times L naught plus rho cos theta. All right, and then we have some potential energy stored in this stretched out spring. We all know the formula for that. That's going to be one half k times the stretch from equilibrium rho squared. All right, so now we have the two terms t and v that we need to define the Lagrangian for our system. We just take their difference, so let's go ahead and, and write that out. And there we go. All right, and so we have this nice little gem here after all that work, the Lagrangian function which is all that we need to describe the dynamics of this system. So once you have your Lagrangian, you plug it straight into the Euler-Lagrange equations, and that is going to come up with our equations of motion for theta and rho. Okay, and because we have two coordinates, rho and theta, that means we're going to be writing out two Euler-Lagrange equations, right? Or in terms of these generalized coordinates q sub j here, what we're really saying is that q1 is equal to rho and q2 is equal to theta. All right, so these are going to be what our two Euler-Lagrange equations are going to look like for coordinates rho and theta. All right, so now you see what the name of the game is here. We need to fill out these derivatives, right? So let's go ahead and start with the top equation. We're going to need dl d rho dot. What's that going to look like? Oh, well look, there's only one rho dot term in this entire Lagrangian. So that derivative is actually very simple. We're just going to have m rho dot. And then of course, what we're really going to need to do is take the time derivative of that. So d dt, oh, that's just going to add one more derivative there. All right, so we've got our first term here. Next, we need dl d rho. Okay, we have a bit more terms, but that's okay. What's dl d rho going to look like? Well, let's go through one at a time. We have this first term here, and so that's going to give us m times l naught plus rho times theta dot squared. Next, we have this term here. So we have plus mg cosine 
theta. Finally, we need to take this last derivative at the end, and so we have minus k rho. Okay, and of course we need to take the difference between these two terms. That's going to give us our first equation here. Excellent. All right, so next let's do the exact same thing for our second Euler-Lagrange equation here. Let's first collect our derivative dl, d theta dot, and so how many theta dot terms do we have? Oh my goodness, only one theta dot term once again. So this is just going to look like m times l naught plus rho squared times theta dot. But now if we take the time derivative of this, we can't just put another derivative here because we also have this rho parameter here. So we're going to have to use a little product rule. And the first term of our product rule is going to look like m theta double dot times l naught plus rho squared. But now we're going to have this second term also, 2m times l naught plus rho times rho dot theta dot. Okay, good. A little product rule. We got our first term here. Next, we have our second term, dl d theta, and that is going to look like, how many theta terms do we have? Oh, just one, this is going to be nice and simple. It's going to look like minus mg times L naught plus rho times sine theta. All right, so now we have the two terms that we need. We take their difference and we're going to have our second equation of motion. Let's go ahead and write that out. And after plugging in, all of our terms here have these m's. We can just get rid of that and we're going to have our second equation of motion. And there we go, we have our equations of motion. Of course, this is fairly complicated. We can see that these rho and theta terms are coupled between the two equations, and we have these nonlinear theta terms. We have a system of two nonlinear coupled differential equations, right? So we're not necessarily just going to be able to go in and directly extract out an analytical solution for theta as a function of time and rho as a function of time given some initial conditions. However, numeric solutions are still very powerful, very useful for analysis. We can do things like make simulations, like the one that you saw at the very beginning of this video. All right, but the most important thing in this video is the process, right? The three key steps. First, we went through and we defined our coordinates. Then, using those coordinates, we defined our Lagrangian, and then we plug that straight into the Euler-Lagrange equations to extract out our equations of motion. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like the video and consider subscribing to the channel. I love to hear about people getting on board. But other than that, thank you so, so much for watching.